Hey, what's up, everyone? It's time for another episode of Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. And here we go with episode 103. Today, we're going to talk about muscle memory. I'm Whistle Kick's founder, but I'm better known as your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistle Kick, if you don't know, makes the absolute best martial arts sparring gear, apparel, and accessories for those of us that practice traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome the new listeners and thank everyone that's come back again. Have you seen our sweatpants? Seriously, it's super comfortable. I'm wearing a pair right now. They come in adult and kid sizes, and we've got a few different colors. They're great and definitely one of our top sellers. If you want to check those out, you can learn more at whistlekick.com. All of our past podcast episodes, show notes, and a lot more are on another website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. From either site, you can sign up for our newsletter, and I really suggest you do that because we offer exclusive content to subscribers, some great discounts, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. What is muscle memory? You've probably heard it. Most of us inherently seem to know what it is, but in case you don't, muscle memory is when your body does something kind of on autopilot. You go automatically. Your muscles remember what to do because you've repeated something a whole bunch of times. It's also called motor learning. Now, as it relates to martial arts, we think of it as when you throw a punch, you always throw the punch in the same way or to the same place. Now, of course, there's some good and some bad that comes out of that. So let's unpack that a little bit. The good is that you're training your body to act. You don't want to have to think about how to throw a punch every time you throw a punch. You've conditioned your body that when you punch, you do certain things. Maybe you turn your hand over, uh, the way that you strike, your hand position on the retraction, all sorts of different things. Really, you're trying to commit action to memory, but not mental, intellectual memory. Because again, you don't want to have to think about those things every time you do them. That's really challenging. You've probably seen people who are working on a form, kata pumse toll, whatever you call it, in your system. And they've stopped and said, hold on, I've got to do it within the context of teaching, right? If you're teaching someone something, sometimes you you get to a point, oh, um, how does that go again? And you have to stop and go back because muscle memory has really taken over for that portion. And there's some good and bad in there and we'll, we'll unpack that. I'm not gonna dig into that example too much because I'm just as guilty of it as anyone else. And I don't know that I need to pick on all of us in that way, right? So. The bad side, really, at the same time that we've learned, hey, I'm going to throw this punch in this way, now we've become predictable. And the more you practice, the more you condition that muscle memory in a certain way, the more predictable you are. You're limiting yourself and you risk responding improperly to your opponent or your partner in some kind of exchange. You've probably also seen students go on autopilot you know, working on a form, working on basics, and mentally they just check out and they're just kind of doing the techniques. Well, how do you really do that if you're not thinking? It's muscle memory. And they just kind of go. And you're not really getting benefit when you're delegating your entire training to muscle memory, right? You're not going to improve anything. You're always going to do it the way you've always done it. And there's some benefit there. I mean, there are certainly some advantages, but why do we practice? Because we want to continue to refine. We want to continue to improve. And there's a strong mental piece there. Muscle memory can also really limit the diversity of your movements. I've seen plenty of people who are only able to throw a, a round kick to the head. That if you ask them to do it to another part of the body, their leg just automatically comes up to the head because that's how they've always done it. And that's a good thing in that they can kick to the head and they know that they can kick to the head, but what if that's not the open target? So how do we deal with that? How do we respond and make muscle memory our friend, but not rely on it in a way that limits us? So really it's about practice. It's about practicing things differently. When it comes to muscle memory, routine is the enemy. It's not that we don't want muscle memory, it's that we don't want to be limited by it. So I just gave the example of someone who can only throw a kick to the head. 
you want to practice things at different heights, you have different body placements. And this isn't a big deal for most martial artists from what I've seen, that especially since people are different heights and partner drills come into play in just about every school, whether it's sparring or, or something else, because different people are different heights, the head, the body are in different places and people are forced as they train to learn how to use their movements in different ways. Another way is by changing things up, doing things dramatically different. And one of the easiest ways I've seen to do that is through combinations. In most schools, there are some rather common combinations, things that your school does that you do often, right? And that's good. They tend to be based around movements that are featured and prominent in the forms or just fit with the approach to combat. And none of that is wrong, okay? But we're talking about muscle memory. We're talking about how to twist that up and not rely on it so heavily. So we've got to do things differently, right? One of my favorite drills, and this works a whole bunch more than just muscle memory, kind of works like this. It doesn't really have a name. So as the instructor or the person leading the drill, you start with two movements, just give a two movement exchange and you take the class through it. And ideally they're traveling back and forth, some kind of stepping. Maybe you do 10 repetitions and you get back to start. Then you'll have the first student in the class, whether you want to work up or down in rank, up to you, add a third movement. And then you go back, you do another 10 repetitions. And you continue to move up or down with the ranks, adding another movement and doing more repetitions each time. Now, depending on the size of the class, this could actually get kind of long. I've done this in classes where the length of the exchange is, is almost the length of a form. Um, actually longer than some forms. But what's interesting about it is that you've got different people, especially the younger ranks, throwing out movements that are going to be really different from what you might normally do. And it's in those differences that the magic, so to speak, happens because you'll probably see high ranks and sometimes especially the higher ranks struggle because they've never thrown a back kick immediately after throwing a downward block, right? Whatever it is. And they're not going to have the muscle memory open to do that. Now, this drill isn't about developing effective combat techniques. So try not to argue, try not to limit the students with what they come up with because you want to be able to flow from one thing to another regardless of whether or not it's, it's effective because that's not what we're working on here, right? You can't always work on everything at once. And finally, think about things at different speeds. Especially when you slow down the movements, you can start to think on what you're doing, why you're doing it, make those refinements, and it's easier to combat the negative sides of muscle memory when you're doing things at a reduced speed. If you're someone who generally goes 100% as fast as you can every time, every drill, this may be really challenging for you, but there's a lot of benefit there. So I would encourage you to step out of your comfort zone and see what you can do. If you're an instructor, check for this with your students. If you're always telling them to punch or kick to a certain location, consider mixing it up. If you're not sure, test them. Ask them to change heights on a sequence that you often do. See what happens. Can they do it? If they can, great. If they can't, try this drill or I'm sure you've got plenty of others because there's more than one way to work on this. Right? So that's our show on muscle memory. It's short, but it's an important subject and one that I really wanted to put out there and get people thinking about. Remember, you can get to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram with the username Whistlekick, or you can leave comments on our website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, or on YouTube. If there's someone that you think should hear the episode, please help them and us and share it with them. We love discussion. We love comments. We love feedback. If you want to be a guest on the show or you want to give us some feedback, head on over to the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, fill out that form, and we'll get it. 
and we'll respond. We try to respond to absolutely every message that comes in. Don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter. And if you want to check out what we offer, like our sweatpants, you can find those at whistlekick.com. You can find all of our sparring gear over at Amazon. And if you're not spun up on our wholesale program, check that out, wholesale.whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.